All right, I want to go through right now some of the testimony that uh, revolves around the Warsaw Ghetto. And this is primarily, not entirely, but primarily um, Dr. Franz Grossler um, in Sima Rotem. Um, these are, this is one of the um, uh, members of the German military who was in charge of, I guess, kind of managing the ghetto. Um, and also one of the uh, members of the community who was part of uh, the Jewish resistance, uh, Sima Rotem. And what you're going to see with him is, is something kind of similar to what we saw with Franz, uh, uh, Franz Sukomo and Abraham Bamba. Um, but it, it's also quite different. Um, so with Grossler, you're going to see somebody involved in the maintenance of uh, the ghetto for the German purposes here. Um, now, ghetto is a term that's used differently in the United States, but it actually has its origins. It's an Italian term. Um, that's why it has that odd spelling of having a G-H at the start. Um, but it's an Italian term, and it goes back to the Renaissance, and I, maybe even late medieval times, when the Italians kept Jewish populations in certain neighborhoods um, because of the anti-Semitism and allowed them to come out during the day to work in certain areas, but then they had to return to them. And so that's where ghetto comes from. Um, and you, it's important to understand that uh, anti-Semitism was not only something from World War II, it, was, it goes way back through European history. Um, and it's uh, something you're going to see elements of it, um, and it's, it's very dangerous. You don't want to make exact equivalencies to other forms of discrimination. Um, but you'll see elements of it at play in all types of discrimination, in which we have, of course, multiple types um, that are alive and well today um, with racism, homophobia, and other types of uh, discrimination. But you're going to see elements of it. And one of the things that comes out with his interview um, with Franz Grossler is Grossler is not uh, Franz Sukomo. With Sukomo, what you saw was somebody who refused to be on camera. He didn't want to be. Um, because he he knew he had uh, simultaneous emotions of uh, knowing he, knowing that what he was what he had done was unacceptable in in the in the you know in the current environment, but also as you watch the interview, there's also an element of pride in how much they endured uh, as uh, the German guards and the others, um, but also in how effective he was at murdering thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Um, you see that pride in him. With uh, Grossler, you're not going to see that. You're going to see something very different. But it's all part of that discrimination practice um, that was going on in the time and part of the mindset that is absolutely necessary in order to undertake this. And let's watch him for a little bit here. Um, and then we'll come back to Sima Rotem. I will mention, by the way, that this gentleman's name, whom I cannot pronounce, um, he was um, the Jewish community member who was kind of designated as the leader of uh, the Jewish community. Um, he did think that the Jews in the end were going to be okay. I, I will try to get along. I will. He was trying to. So he gets mentioned in this testimony. He was a Jewish leader trying to get along with the, um, the German occupation in order for his Jewish community to survive um, this period. He thought that would work. Um, you're going to see he didn't hold on to that belief for long. Das weiß ich. Ja. Ja. 
Also, aber es also, funktioniert während, während, während drei Jahren. Jahren. Ich meine, wir sind jetzt zwei und 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 zw
Um, and here he is, he's looking over the um, uh, model of the city, and you'll see that he cannot speak about it for quite some time. And let's, let me go ahead and uh, leave this um, go. And you can imagine what he's doing right now. He's recalling his time there. And they're just noting that the Jews got their weapons from what the Germans left behind. Um, uh, other, the Polish uh, resistance and others would not give them arms, and they had no factories of their own. And you can, I, I do let it play for a little bit, um, because I, I know it's a little bit odd um, that they, he does this. And let me come back in here. Um, but you can feel what he's going through as he's coming back through it. He's reliving it um, and re-experiencing it, um, what went down with them and what went on. You don't get that from many other people. Um, so you see that with him while he's remembering and while he's recalling uh, what's going on. <clears throat> Let me jump up a little bit. And just be aware that his method of talking about this is entirely stone-faced, but he's talking in a more general terms um, about generally what, what went, went on. He doesn't talk as much about individual days. He's going to write here, and you're going to see he's processed things differently than what we've seen um, from the other witnesses, from, say, Michael Pachovnik or um, Abraham Bamba. Nous étions dans un tel état que nous n'avions ni la perspective de voir la signification même de la civilisation. 
אור ליום ראשון במאי, נשלחו שני אנשים זיגמים ואנוכי על מנת ליצור קשר עם אנטה שיצר לצד הארי. ‫אני This is what Warsaw looks like today. כשמצאנו את עצמנו ברחוב, Hold it there for a moment. And what you're seeing um, with both Franz Grossler um, and what uh, Sima Rotem are describing, it's not always the people with the guns who are killing people. Um, it's all of these different layers of people accepting um, the dehumanization of another people around them. Um, with genocide, that is an absolutely important element. You have to treat a certain group as if they're not really human. And what you're seeing is that when uh, these men escaped, for, uh, temporarily at least, out of the ghetto, um, and the world they lived in in the ghetto with dead bodies in the streets was dramatically different than outside the ghetto within Poland, um, within Warsaw, where life went on normally. Um, but if they uh, ventured out of the Warsaw ghetto, they were immediately seized by some of the Polish residents. Um, and the thing is, it's not that every Pole was going to seize them, but there was always some amongst them who would do it, but the vast majority of people would tolerate it, and tolerate that behavior. So let me come back in here. And what you're going to be seeing, or what you'll see with uh, Warsaw with the ghetto, is that there are levels of toleration, of the dehumanization of the Jews. And this is part of the discrimination practice that goes on with all different types of discrimination is dehumanizing them. And you see it differently with people like Sukomo, who takes pride in how effective he was at murdering people, to Franz Grassler, who doesn't really see himself as, I, you know, I was there, but um, he doesn't really take responsibility for his part. Um, to the people in the city who were actively grabbing the Jews, um, to the people who would tolerate it next to them. 
um, you get all these different layers of acceptance of this dehumanization and uh, destruction of the Jewish population in um, the testimony. So be aware of that as he goes through it. Um, and you'll see him discussing the way the ghetto actually worked and the way it was used um, in order to execute um, all the Jewish population throughout Europe. And something kind of in closing here, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go with this. Um, be aware that this is something that could go on and has gone on at different times and different periods in different ways. Um, it is dangerous and, and wrong to make a, what would be called a false equivalence. Um, that this is just like, you know, the killing of the of this, and this wasn't as bad as, you know, the Japanese internment. Um, those, I, you know, I, I've seen many people make what, what are known as false equivalents, um, equating what happened uh, in World War II with what went on with the Native Americans um, as the... the um, as their land was stripped from them and their land was occupied with the uh, you know the um, with the, the migration of the uh, of the United States across the US they're not the same thing nor is the internment of the Japanese in California that's not the same thing um, drawing an equivalency saying that they're the same um, in order to say you know hey well California didn't murder the Japanese population um, but the elements were there. Um, it doesn't make it okay. Um, what you're seeing with um, Rotem's testimony, with Grossler's testimony, um, is the idea, or, or is the, the levels of tolerance for this dehumanization of another population, of people who are different. Um, it's not okay to make equivalencies between the um, Holocaust and other events in history, because it distorts both events. Um, it blinds you to what's going on in each event, and it would blind you with the, you know, the Japanese internment and other things. Also be aware, I, I know lots of people like to think of themselves as, oh, I would have been with the Freedom Fighters, um, but when you see Grassler and others, and um, uh, Sukomo and others, they seem, and they are, very normal people it's very easy to fall into this ideology. It's not something that different people do. It's something that could happen to any population at any time, given if you are prone to dehumanizing another group. Um, so be aware of that with this, okay, um, as you uh, follow through. So um, go through and get your uh, decide on which part of it you want to write on. Um, in each one, Chelmno, Treblinka, and uh, the Warsaw Ghetto, each work differently and be aware of how each one works as you're going through the testimonies and collecting uh, the quotations that you think are most important. Okay, take care guys.